Well, I want to welcome everybody to today's session. And um, my name is Bob Perciusepi. I'm the president of the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, or C2ES. You can see the name behind me here. Um, we're an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to bringing diverse groups together to look for solutions to energy and climate policy. And today is a, is a pretty good example of what we try to do. And we're pleased to bring together a a really good group of, of forward thinkers, forward thinking utility executives like Ralph Izzo from PSEG, leaders from innovative companies like Intel, EMC, Nest, and APX, and city and state pioneers in energy efficiency from Illinois to Minnesota to Philadelphia. And we're really uh, excited that the Energy Foundation and the Digital Energy Sustainability Solutions Campaign is helping sponsor some of this work. You know, we're here to talk about energy efficiency, and it seems to be a pretty uh, simple thing to contemplate. Uh, every one of us has probably done something in our lives to be more efficient. Um, yet when it comes to electricity, we still have uh, significant gaps in how we go about doing it and why we, and we continue to waste uh, more energy than we need to in this country and in the world. Um, we waste it energy when we produce it, we, there's waste when we transmit it, and there's waste when we use it. Uh, some people uh, like to compare it to uh, going food shopping. And you go and you buy a, a whole bunch of groceries, and you're on your way home and you, you know, leave one of the bags at the, at the supermarket. Then you throw a couple of bags out the car on the way home, and then you leave another couple of bags on the front, on the front lawn, and then you get back in the house and you got one bag left. Now, that may be an exaggeration, but all along the way, there's loss in, in energy. Uh, and, and those of you who are students, um, as I think our first speaker is, of the law of thermodynamics, uh, you, there's, a, there's a lot of technology behind how all that happens and how we can improve that. And so when we waste energy, we waste money. And when we waste energy, we also are producing more emissions than we need to produce. And the counter is also true. If we save energy, we can save money and we can reduce emissions. So um, all of these uh, impacts affect both, of our, both, our, um, both our environment and our economy. So there are three things that I think we need to address. One is. Um, energy efficiency should be a key strategy that we have going forward, both ec for economic purposes as well as environmental purposes. Information and communications technology can help us achieve energy efficiency, and that's going to be a key part of what we're talking about today. And it's going to take cities, states, and businesses working together to make this happen. And, and that's why we have the group of people we have today with us to try to talk about that. You know, the EPA Clean Power Plan is something that's on the front burner for a lot of states and cities and companies who are in uh, the energy business. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that's a key observation of, of doing the, the uh, energy or the clean power plans is, is how, um, how important energy efficiency is to cost effectively implementing those plans. Um, C2ES has a report that we, that's in the back of the room that looks at the, uh, much of the modeling that has been done over the last year or so, looking at all the different options under those plans. And one of the things that's ubiquitous in that report, in our summary, is that the least cost option is energy efficiency. And that there can actually be a projection overall decline in the demand for electricity over time and still uh, maintain the quality of life and, and all of the different uh, goals we have personally and corporately and commercially for the use of electricity. And this is a pretty key finding. But we also found that, um, that by and large, this is a pretty low cost uh, effort. Um, the studies look at everything from saving money to costing upwards near $10 billion to implement the plan. But even at the high end, we're talking about 25 cents a day uh, to have uh, reduced greenhouse gas emissions. So how do we get more energy efficient in the future? How do we get there? How do we make that happen? And that's a key question. So 
we, we have technology, and we have technology right now that can help. And uh, we can help, that can help be more energy efficient. And so we'll hear more today about intelligent efficiency. And we have another document in the back of the room that talks about this systems approach to looking at that drive back from the grocery store. How can you keep from dropping the groceries or leaving them behind at the store? How can you make sure the windows of the car are closed so that you don't lose it out there or that you forget the groceries on the front lawn? Um, how can technology uh, and intelligent efficiency help throughout that whole system? And whether it's uh, networking devices, whether it's sensors, whether it's smart grids, uh, whether it's how we transmit electricity, and how can we measure and verify and make sure any of the efforts we have are credible. Those are all important parts of the technology, but certainly looking at it, we can see in the near term, you know, upwards to 20 to 25 percent reduction in, in um, the use of, of uh, energy or energy efficiency, and we can see reducing greenhouse gas emissions because of it. We also looked at what the federal government might be able to do by being more energy efficient. And, and without uh, a huge amount of work, you know, and many others have looked at the same results, that you can save upwards to $5 billion a year uh, at the federal level just by uh, improving some efficiency. The, the last thing I want to mention here uh, is that cities, states, and companies are going to be pretty important in this, in this whole uh, in this whole arena. How do we take uh, the businesses that are providing electricity and power, the b businesses that are innovating in that arena, the businesses that are innovating with technology, and then the cities and states who are putting together programs that can help get it implemented. It's not self-implementing. It doesn't just happen. There has to be a way to, to get a larger penetration of these technologies. And so uh, innovative partnerships, uh, 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 innovative programs, uh, all of this is going to be pretty important going forward. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop with that general introduction because I hope you'll all have a chance to ask questions to some of our panelists as we go forward today. But first I want to introduce our, our first speaker, uh, Ralph Izzo. Ralph is starting us off this morning and, uh, and he's given a lot of thought, I know this from personal conversations with him to the whole idea of efficiency and the future, the future of electric utilities and power companies and how these two things work together. Um, he's in his eighth year as chairman and CEO of the Public Services Enterprise Group, or PSEG, as we all call it. And it has a very diverse portfolio of electric uh, power plants uh, in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast, including some solar facilities around, around the country. Grew up in New York. Uh, has a PhD in physics from Columbia. That's why I know he kno knows about the law of thermodynamics. Um, and uh, another thing that he and I share, including since I do also know about the law of thermodynamics, um, and I'm not even a lawyer. Um, um, the other thing we have in common is we're both pitchers. So Ralph pitched in college. I pitched in high school. Um, and so uh, in order to be a good pitcher, you have to be efficient. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to last too long. Um, but he's been a researcher, a scientist, well, pitching is very important, but a researcher, a scientist, a policy advisor to both Democrats and Republicans, and a successful businessman. And he brings all of those experiences together, and he can see a path forward for reliable and efficient power uh, in the future. And um, I think you and others call this utility 2.0. Uh, where do, how do we uh, how do we move forward in, a, in, in this kind of, uh, of an environment? And he's recognized as a leader in this uh, across the country and among his peers in the electric generating industry. And I'll have to say, except for his fastball, he's a pretty straight shooter. Um, so welcome, uh, uh, help join me in welcoming Ralph uh, to the podium here to give us a few thoughts. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you, Bob. So uh, a little confession, in 1976, there was a Major League Baseball player strike. And I was a sophomore in college, and my life ambition was to be a ball player. So I went with the team down to Florida, and there were several major leaguers who were working out at the college we were at. I forget if it was uh, Florida Southern or Eckerd College. 
and I got to witness it firsthand. That afternoon I went back and started studying thermodynamics much more carefully. <laughs> I knew this wasn't going to happen. So I've never heard the grocery analogy. I've heard about low-hanging fruit, and unfortunately there's still a lot of fruit on the tree. I've heard people describe it as found money on the ground, but people walking past it. And I've heard others describe it as the best investment an investor could make, and yet people don't make the investment. And in all three of those analogies that I just offered and the one that Bob did, we're talking about energy efficiency. So I want to thank you for letting me be here this morning to talk about my favorite subject. It truly is. And to Bob for all of his efforts, uh, not just in energy efficiency, but as a career protector of the environment. To those of you who are in policy circles who've been advocating for this kind of change. And also to our friends at EPA who've recognized that energy efficiency could easily provide for 20% of the reductions needed to achieve the 2030 carbon reductions that are anticipated in the clean power plan. So if energy efficiency is the best way to go, why do we think that? Uh, so we've all heard of win-win situations. Once in a while people talk about triple wins. I, I would maintain that energy efficiency is actually a quadruple win. Without sacrificing lifestyle, uh, consumers can pay less, the environment can be better off, we could begin to employ a, a group of workers that uh, are politely referred to as non-traditional labor pools because of the skills that are required in doing this. And last but not least, which I'll return to later on, we can help investors make some money by doing this. And uh, so why doesn't it happen? There have been some great studies as to why it doesn't happen. Uh, uh, my favorite is one that was put out by McKinsey that talked about all the different impediments in the marketplace to energy efficiency. We all, well, some of us remember. President Carter with his sweater with the patches on his elbow in front of the fireplace talking about how we need to be more efficient and how we could save money. At that time, it was to focus mostly on transportation, not electricity. But yet, it doesn't seem to take place. So uh, we've done all kinds of analysis. We've read all types of reports. But I finally decided I was just going to go out and talk to some customers. And I spoke to a Fortune 50 CEO who shall go nameless. And any guesses as to what the payback period he required for non-core investments, which is what he considered energy efficiency, it was a non-core investment to his business? Okay. Two years? That's a typical guess. Some people say one to three years. Months. Three months. Yeah, three months was what he expected. Now, I'm a little better than that, but not much better. When my team comes to me and says, we'd like to build a power plant, we run a discounted cash flow. And as long as it's cash positive on a discounted basis, in between years 25 and 30, I'm good with that. If my HR vice president comes to me and says she wants to invest in a new IT system that will help us process payroll better, she's got a three-year hurdle rate. So I went out and talked to other customers. I said, right, there's got to be some people with a long-term perspective. So we went and talked to hospitals. I said, now, you, you, you know this building's going to be here 30 years. You know you have a decrepit old heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system. Why don't you replace it? And the hospital president looked at me, bit on his tongue real hard, as to, so as to not say, you idiot. But uh, he nonetheless said, OK, let me ask you, Ralph. If you choose a hospital for your family, he knew not to say if you choose a hospital for yourself, because you might get a strange answer. But if you choose a hospital for your family, are you going to go to the hospital with the best medical equipment or the one with the best heating, ventilating, and air conditioning system? So if I, as president of this hospital, have disposable income, discretionary disposable income, where am I going to invest it? No brainer. Went and talked to university presidents. Same question. So OK, Ralph, you're going to choose a university for your kids. Are you going to choose those that use the fewest kilowatt hours per square foot or those that have the best professors and faculty on the face of the planet? And guess what it takes to attract those best professors and faculty? It takes great lab space, which is expensive. So, so the non-core hurdle rate, if you will, the, the investment that's required for, in this case, customers who are the investor to be able to, willi to be willing to go forward with energy efficiency, typically far exceeds what any rational investor, if you will, uh, might expect to have happen. So therefore, why not replace the investor and not let it be the customer, but let it be the utility? Why the utility? We have the brand. We have the customer relationships. And most importantly, we have universal access to customers. And we don't have the challenges associated with customer acquisition for what might be perceived to be something that the market should provide. So let's talk about a few of the changes that are taking place in our industry that encourage us, at least at PSEG, to want to do this. First is a long-dated change. It's one that's not brand new. But it's the fact that for many decades, the nation has progressively moved forward in its environmental regulation. 
Now, the pace of that change ebbs and flows with the economy. Sadly, it's inversely proportional to that. The more the economy stalls, the more we seem to come off the accelerator as, as far as environmental improvements are made, they're concerned. But we never really dial back or reverse course. That interest in environmental progressive, progressivity has taken on new meaning with the advent of carbon. Uh, uh, Bob and I will talk a little bit about thermodynamics, but very little. For those of you who remember your high school chemistry, once upon a time you were instructed that perfect combustion of hydrocarbons results in two byproducts, water and CO2. And it was described as the bubbles in your soda, because that was the result of perfect combustion. And we now find out that perfection is his problems too. So as we move towards a carbon-free environment or a, carbon re a reduced carbon environment, we have more formidable challenges than we've ever had before as it comes to environmental protection. That's resulting in some changes in technology. And we'll hear about many of them today, uh, which we are genuinely excited about, but, but a technology that is quite candidly not quite ready for prime time and therefore in need of some subsidized support. Well, we've created some subsidy mechanisms to deliver that support. And I don't argue with the need for subsidies at all. I argue with the delivery mechanism we've created for subsidies. It's perhaps most egregious in the renewable supply space. The median per capita income in the United States is about $50,000 per household. I said per capita, I should have said per household. About $50,000. The median household income in New Jersey is about $70,000. The median household income of people who are using net metering subsidies in New Jersey is a little over $110,000. Now, the good news is that's down from 150000 not that long ago. The bad news is we still have people who are struggling to put a third meal on the table, paying for people who are uh, two times greater than the national uh, median household income. What's wrong with the subsidy is the manner in which it's being delivered, not that there's one that's needed at all. Another example in energy efficiency space is yours truly. Uh, we decided that we would finish the space above our garage. It was a great storage location, but we were cautioned that there'd be wide variations in temperatures above the garage. So we should buy an energy efficient heat pump. And I received an application for this. I could not understand why anybody would pay me $750 to do something that was perfectly logical and was in my best interest. And I struggled with whether or not to accept that $750. I did. I went to confession the next day and got over it. And uh, $750 later, we had help from people who quite candidly don't uh, attract my compensation paying for my uh, highly efficient heat pump. So the regressivity of, of the way in which we deliver these subsidies are a challenge. And as a result, I think that the inefficiency of the subsidy delivery mechanism is hampering the use of these technologies. And I would like our utility to become the best sales channel for these technolo technology providers. I'm not in the business of writing code. I'm not in the business of manufacturing thermostats. I'm not in the business of manufacturing lighting. No more am I in the business, nor am I in the business of building uh, combined cycle turbines. I'm in the business of installing them and providing the services that come from them to customers. So I'd love to be able to do more of that. And unless I think we unleash the ability of utilities to do that, we will be stagnant in terms of uh, wide-scale deployment of these technologies. <laughs> I often joke about the fact that if Alexander Graham Bell was alive today, he would think that millennia had passed since he made that fateful call to, to his uh, colleague Watson. Yet if Thomas Edison were to walk the streets today, he would think he was waking up from an afternoon nap as he would recognize much of the hardware that's in use today. As a matter of fact, uh, I will tell you that I ha still have a picture of Thomas Edison christening one of our power plants at the Kearney site in New Jersey, a site that's still active. The power plant's no longer in operation. Third, uh, last, but by no means least, is this interesting phenomenon that's taking place in society, which has to do with our ever-increasing reliance upon electricity, even as we use less of it. If you think about the fact that if you're the worst consumer on the face of the planet and you were to replace your refri refrigerator tomorrow or today, you would buy a refrigerator that was a much more efficient device than the one that's in your home. Similarly, if you were the worst consumer on the face of the planet, you would go out and replace your air conditioner, your heating system, you would replace your existing unit with one that's far more efficient. And the same can be true for your lighting system. I just named the three biggest energy consuming devices in any premise, with the exception maybe of a large industrial company like an Air Products or something like that that's really in the business of, of chemicals, conversion of energy into chemical form. And what, do you replace it, and what are you doing to add to your electricity consumption? Well, you're buying all sorts of portable devices, communication devices, information technology devices, entertainment systems. And the increase in electricity demand resulting from those purchases is no way 
uh, sufficient to offset the decline in energy associated with the replacement of the larger devices I mentioned a moment ago. So we literally have people becoming more reliant on electricity even as they're using less of it. This was never, ever so evident as it was during Superstorm Sandy, because sadly most people don't recognize the value and the importance of electricity until it's not there. So Superstorm Sandy over two years ago hits the East Coast, and I will never forget that within the first 12 hours uh, a handful of uh, colleagues of mine, CEO uh, from the Edison Electric Institute, were on a phone call facilitated by EEI with the President of the United States. Now, he won't remember that conversation, but I don't often have a conversation with the President of the United States, so I remember that. And he wanted to know when we were going to get Newark Airport back, what were we doing about some of our urban centers, and what about the refinery industry in northeastern, uh, northeastern New Jersey. Within the next 48 or 72 hours, I forget, I was on the phone with his national security advisor every day for the next two weeks. I was on the phone with the Deputy Secretary of Energy. Ralph LaRosa, my colleague who runs our utility, was on the phone every day for the next two weeks with uh, Governor Christie. Perhaps, though, the human drama was never more real than it was about two days into the, into the storm and the outage. Ralph, the other Ralph, received a phone call from a cardiologist who had heard on the news reports that we were restoring uh, critical customers first. And among the critical customers we had listed were hospitals. And this surgeon literally had two open heart surgeries scheduled that day, and his hospital was not back yet. And he wanted to know whether or not he should cancel the surgeries, do it on backup supply, what our point of view was, or whether we would have him back, because lives were at stake. Well, we restored that circuit, and he did those surgeries. About two weeks later, I received an email from a concerned stay-at-home parent who said if we did not restore her power that day, her teenager was coming to live with me. <laughs> and I, I, I've told that story for, you know, repeatedly over two years, and it always gets a laugh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad it does. The reality is there is no doubt in my mind, from the President of the United States to the National Security Advisor to that cardiologist to that parent, getting power back was the single most important thing on their mind at that point in time. Well, how do we do that? I mean, we're a pretty reliable system. We have four to five nines of reliability, depending on whether you're looking at transmission or distribution. Well, we've stopped talking about reliability, and we've started talking about resiliency. In our case, if we just look at Hurricane Irene and Superstorm Sandy, there were about 29 substations that were affected. We need $3.6 billion to harden them, as we call it. And when we looked at the bill impact, the state of New Jersey decided that we shouldn't get $3.6 billion, but for the next five years, we should spend $1.2 billion. So we have maybe touched a third of the problem of those two storms, let alone uh, broader issues. The point of, of, of the investments that we're making in resiliency is no different than the discussion around the subsidies associated with cleaner sources of energy. Both of these <coughs> result in bill impacts. Both of these types of investments, whether it's in cleaning the environment or making the system more resilient, result in higher and higher rates. Now, we've had some help the past few years in mitigating those higher rates as a result of the shale gas re revolution, as a result of low interest rates. We've actually been able to pour $10 billion into various investments at PSE&G while lowering bills 23%. And those investments were primarily hardware, transmission hardware, and, uh, and distribution hardening hardware. But we did spend a $1 billion on solar and $300 million on energy efficiency. But I think the magic in that, in, the, in that regard is going to be running out. I don't believe natural gas prices are going to go much below the $2.50 per MMBTU that you see at the Henry Hub. And I find it hard to believe that interest rates are going to go uh, down any further. I'm not here to predict the direction of interest rates or natural gas prices. I'll leave the market to do that. But it's hard to believe that we'll get the same level of benefit when gas prices tumble from $10 to the 2 to $3 range they are now. So if we have to make these investments, as I believe we do, how can we mitigate the impact on the customer bill? And what screams out at me is to do that using energy efficiency. And we have not done enough. There is no reason why the United States of America should be 13th out of the 16 largest economies in energy efficiency. So how can we do this? Uh, as I said a moment ago, PSE and G has spent about $300 million in energy efficiency the last uh, five years. Uh, we were recently given approval to spend another $100 million. That's real money. You add that up, that's $400 million over five years. Uh, well, well, the next $100 million will be over the next three years, so it'll be an eight-year span. This year alone, we will spend $2.5 billion on transmission. The, the prioritization is wrong. 
Uh, first and foremost, the emphasis needs to be on energy efficiency. How can we live as we're comfortable, in the way in which we've grown accustomed to living, but while using the least amount of energy, first and foremost. Number two, whatever energy we need to use, how can we deliver that as inexpensively and as cleanly as possible, and as reliably as possible. So the vision I have for the future is one in which people use a lot less electricity than they use today, but it's almost guaranteed to get there to them as reliably as is humanly possible and with as minimal impact on the environment as is possible. So let me end where I teased a few minutes ago, which was what's in it for the investor if the utility is the investor. Just about every study I've seen suggests that there's a sizable amount of energy efficiency that can be accomplished for about five cents per kilowatt hour. In fact, I've seen estimates that for less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour, we can replace 30% of the electricity consumption in America. But let's stick with the five cents a kilowatt hour number. Five cents a kilowatt hour is about the marginal cost of a mid-merit coal or natural gas plant uh, short-run marginal cost. It is far less than the long-run marginal cost of a new power plant. So the proposition is simple. About half of a utility bill is the fixed cost associated with distribution. The other half is supply. About half of the supply is fuel. If I can install energy efficiency at or less than the fuel price, then I can recover all of my fixed costs, pass some small savings on to the customer, and, uh, and help achieve the carbon emissions targets that we talked about. It's not magic. It's not fairy dust. There is a loser in this. It's first the power generation business. I'm not worried about that. I own a power generation business. It sells into a 170,000 megawatt market. I'm talking about 2 million customers who use about 10,000 megawatts at the peak. I've got a much bigger market to play in my generation business due to the high voltage transmission system that allows me to interconnect to other areas. So I can be successful in those markets without worrying about too much cannibalization of that business. Other generators may not be as confident about their ability to achieve that, but that's their issue, not mine. Who else is the loser in this? It's the fuel company. At the end of the day, if a generator doesn't sell to Ralph, but instead they sell to Mary, they're okay. But if there are fewer kilowatts being sold, then the person who supplies the uranium-238, the, the, uh, the natural gas, or the coal doesn't have to supply as much. But I would suggest that utilities are not in the fuel business, so that's not our issue. So the economics can work. There can be savings for the customer. There can be investment opportunities if regulators permit the fixed cost recovery of the distribution system and the earnings on the energy efficiency investment to accrue to the utility investor. The environment wins. We get to hire a whole bunch more people. And President Carter gets his way from about 40 years ago. So with that, I'll stop. And I thank you for your attention. You've been very patient. And I, I think, Bob, did you want to get together? So um, thanks for that. Um, uh, overview and and uh, the interest that uh, that you have put into it and and the eloquence of which you describe a, a future system of of, fun, of running uh, an electric utility um, obviously the other one of the other sides of that equation is actually getting technology and I mean there's stuff that you can uh, invest in but then uh, companies uh, houses residential the manufacturing facilities, they, they have to make investments on their side as well. And so you have this mix of, of players to make this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so what, uh, states and cities obviously can play an important role in that and what their local policies are. So how do you see all those uh, working together along with the kind of vision you have? So, so one of the things we've done in our energy efficiency programs, Bob, is we've targeted the investments uh, to places where we think the subsidies make the most sense. So we've done a lot of work with hospitals under the assumption that while uh, hospitals are private entities, uh, all of our customers use them and the more economically efficient we can make them, the more they have the opportunity to invest in important um, medical diagnostic equipment. We've invested in schools. We've given money to multifamily dwellings because, candidly, sometimes those customers have the biggest challenge paying their bills. We have tended to invest, however, in low-tech solutions. Uh, and that goes back to where I began uh, with the low-hanging fruit. Okay. Uh, while I am a huge fan, just given my technical background of sophisticated sensors and all, home, household automation, you'd be amazed at how much progress we can make by caulking windows. And uh, so, so, so that's really what, what we've done. We've, 
no, I don't want to suggest we've corked win only corked windows, but we've replaced some basic chillers and heating systems. Uh, but I do think there's an opportunity to make major investments by redirecting subsidies in technology. So, for example, uh, it's less about energy efficiency, but more about energy storage. Yeah. You know, I would love to see some of the subsidies right now that are directed to developers be directed to the manufacturers of battery storage systems. Now, how would you do that? Just take the economic value of a net metered payment and give that to the customer for an energy storage system. That's going to create certain gaps that, uh, that will have to be made up by someone. It could be made up by the rest of the customer base in the form of, the residual sub of a residual subsidy, or it can be made up by the, by the homeowner who's installing the, the uh, storage system. I think that that's a smarter way to deliver subsidies because now what you're doing is you're creating a market for, uh, uh, for storage systems that are not quite there yet from a technology point of view, but they won't get there unless we start buying more of them and creating the incentive for them to do more research. So those are the types of things that we've been advocating for, is to really redirect the subsidy mechanisms so that we can do more of the technology installations and, and have the money flow towards technologies that we think have promise but aren't quite there yet. Okay, well, I, I, th this, this interwoven network of local, state, uh, tax policy, uh, it, you know, incentives or subsidies, uh, and investments that you make as a utility obviously are, all have to work together right. to make to get a greater penetration of of the low hanging fruit leaving the grocery basket together all those things so the, the, that combination I apologize but if I went off in a different direction you know, we'd love to see a combination of the externalities being reflected in the price nationwide, right? So uh, an economy-wide, nationwide price on carbon, however one delivers that would be uh, a great place to start. And then you do leave it to states to decide uh, to what extent they want to encourage utilities to be participants or not be participants. But then I if it's more the latter, if the utilities are not the participants, I would just strongly encourage states to look at uh, who are the beneficiaries and who are the payers in the program. And, and rethink that because I do think that the, the the mechanisms right now are skewed and very regressive. So we have a we have a, a great deal of work that's going to go on on that over the next uh, over the next year as states start to do their plans. I, I think I saw something in the in the press today about uh, somebody has done a review and found that 41 states are actually working on their plans or talking to their neighbors. Um, I think that's a pretty logical thing to expect mm -hmm. that states are going to be exploring how they go about doing that and we may hear a little bit more of that sure. in some of the panel discussions. Um, that's going to stimulate a lot of discussion and, con and, and, and uh, work at the state and local level uh, and along with the utilities that, that you just mentioned. It will. I, I just, uh, and, and, and certainly APA is doing what it can with the tools available to it. There's no substitute for a nationwide market however, right? And uh, if, if State X decides that uh, they have a centralized plan that is optimal for them and state Y has a different centralized plan that's optimal for them. It just sends very different signals to the marketplace and if the market is facing a, a, a ubiquitous $20 per ton carbon price, then the market will come up with optimal yeah. solutions as opposed to, okay, let me interpret what this state wants versus what that state wants and the effective price of carbon is there is $10, the effective price of carbon here is $5 and those might be very different solutions yeah. and, and, and subscale. I think I, I think uh, there's an opportunity for some states to, um, uh, and some already are, as we know, uh, I want, uh, testing and using interstate approaches, which right. does create a regional approach, right. um, and hopefully we'll see more of that. But I think I'm going to open this up to the audience to get some uh, questions from the audience for, um, for Ralph. Anybody have any? We got one right here. Wait a minute, here comes the microphone. Hi, uh, I'm Michael Tubman with C2ES. And uh, you started talking in your uh, initial presentation a little bit about utility 2.0 mm -hmm. and kind of that idea. Uh, I'm wondering if you could go into some more detail about sure. how energy efficiency and utility 2.0 might work together. Yeah, so, so uh, of course, if you ask five people with their definition of utility 2.0, you'll get six answers. But you're asking one person, so I'll just give you one answer. Uh, yeah, somewhere, somehow, somebody decided that uh, the regulated monopoly includes the meter. The reality is we could have designed an IEEE standard, gotten some laboratory to 
uh, UL Labs to validate the safety. And all of us could go buy a meter at our favorite home improvement center that meets those standards. Right? We can, some of us can buy metal ones, others can buy one that's glass in case, some people can buy a pink one, some can buy small ones, some can buy a big one. I mean, this is, and it's not a particularly exciting shopping experience. So someone decided a long time ago that that's part of the regular monopoly. Why can't we go beyond that meter and provide universal access in the sense of 2.0 to customers with solutions that make the most sense for that customer? Maybe for a 24 by 7 operation, it is a combination of self-supply and energy storage. But for most poor load factor customers, it isn't that. It's some combination of demand response where you shave the peak and energy efficiency where you use as little as possible throughout the day. Uh, with, through more efficient lighting, heating, and air conditioning systems. I'm not suggesting that utilities should buy people's refrigerators for them. Uh, but, but I don't know of any, any folks who have a personal relationship with their building envelope uh, and, their, uh, and, their, and their mechanical room. And that, that's the kind of thing I think would be a no-brainer for initial utility 2.0. And their thermostats. I mean, uh, maybe we can give them three different varieties of, of thermostats. But, uh, and, and, and two different options on whether they want them control it themselves if they want to be programmed. So you then get two by six, you get 12 different scenarios for consumers. And I think beyond that, consumers would say, leave me alone. Look, at the end, no one, no one, not even Ralph Izzo, wakes up in the morning and says, I can't wait to use a kilowatt hour. Right? You just don't do it. Now, maybe you want to watch the Rangers play the Tampa Bay Lightning tonight, or you want to watch, go to some show or some see some play. But I've heard electricity appropriately described as a tax on living. So I think the more of it we can do for customers, uh, starting with the least those who can least afford it first, the better off we are. And that would be my definition of 2.0, is just going beyond the meter and doing smart things for customers. You have to be careful with those ranger comments. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, we got one over here. She's, Mike's coming. Thank you. Without asking you to, oh, Jared Blum, I run the Polyiso Insulation Manufacturers Association. Without asking you to wade into the political waters too deeply, do you have any opinion as to how the, the Sandy experience in, the, in a political situation such as the governor of, of New Jersey um, and the state legislature, did it change their approach to the role of government in achieving some of these goals, resiliency, efficiency, et cetera, your concept about uh, subsidies? Were there any change of minds? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that, yes, I think that there were. Not sufficient in terms of scale or pace from my point of view. So in the past, we had had programs that were called capital infrastructure programs that took a year to file and get approval, and they typically lasted for 18 months, and they were many hundreds of millions of dollars, about six or seven hundred million dollars, I think the largest ones were. So after Sandy, we put in a filing for $3.6 billion, so five times bigger. We got approval for $1.2 billion. So the regulator's response to me was, my goodness, Ralph, what more could you want? We gave you something that was almost twice as big as anything we've ever done before and lasts twice as long because it's a three to five year program depending upon which aspect we're looking at. And my response to that was, yes, I recognize it. Thank you. You clearly understood that this was bigger than anything we've ever done before. But what you don't understand is we're just touching the, we're just scratching the surface with this investment. So it's a, it, it depends on where you come from, right? So if I'm the regulator, wow, I'm proud of the fact that I've done something I've never done before. But as somebody who has no end of steady engineers coming into my office telling me what needs to be done. Well-intentioned, really caring engineers who just take a tremendous pride in the system and understand the infirmities associated with its current design. Uh, we're nowhere near where we need to be. Right here. Hi, I'm Anna. I uh, noticed that a lot of energy efficiency is frequently um, eliminated by the fact that users that are operating these energy efficient technologies aren't necessarily operating them efficiently. That's how we see lead buildings that are not performing as well as they should. Um, how does the utility incentivize behavior modification? To my knowledge, there are no rebates or incentives currently to support behavior change in people. Yes, yeah, so Anna, this is, this is one of the toughest issues that I uh, get asked about, and I don't have a good answer. I've often heard it described as the rebound effect. Right, so so I, I scream at my teenagers for not shutting the lights off 
because it's so expensive to run these inefficient light bulbs, but now that I've got these efficient light bulbs, I don't scream at them anymore. Or uh, you probably don't remember, but billboards used to be made of paper. And people would actually you know, just roll them up, and you'd see them dangling from these precarious positions, putting this paper up. And now they're all electric. And, and because uh, electric LEDs and whatever else technology they use, they're so inefficient. I guess some of the motors are efficient, not inefficient. I don't have a good answer for that, other than you have to hope that people are doing this largely to reduce their bills. And if they don't see their bills getting reduced, that might invoke some behavior changes. But. Uh, uh, when I first learned how to drive my car, I didn't have seat belts. Now, if I pull out of the driveway before my kids put their seat belts on, they report me to the Division of Youth and Family Services. So, I think there's a fair amount of education that can help. But I realize that's not as it's not as firm an answer as I'd like to give, and probably as you would want to hear. So, it's a combination of education and, and consumers realizing that wow, my bill went down. Now it's creeping back up. What's going on? And let me let me tell the kids to shut the lights when they leave the room. Um, back in the corner. Hi. Uh, so, I know that you are the CEO of a of a utility, but I'd like you to put a hat of other utilities on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will first state my hypothesis, which is our utilities are not particularly good on the customer side of the meter. Mm. I don't know if you agree or not. Mm. But we had at Van Ness Feldman, where I work, uh, an, an experiment. We had a client willing to help us uh, approach several utilities, not yours, um, with a proposition, uh, giving them, in one case, 65 pages of commercial buildings with owners willing to do maximum energy efficiency retrofits and wanting the utility to do the job. After seven or so meetings at one utility and quite a few at another, not a single building got retrofitted. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I mean, I was triumphant because my hypothesis was proved true, but also very depressed <laughs> mm -hmm. because we're at a stage where we need utilities to really be the prime movers here. Uh, comments? Yeah, so I, I, I would say that obviously it varies by company, and maybe uh, boringly, predictably, uh, I would sound defensive and say it's not true about company. We have a thousand men and women who are appliance service repair technicians. They travel around the state of New Jersey fixing everything from dishwashers to refrigerators to heating systems. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, their moment of truth service, so, so customers had an experience typically is anywhere from a 9.2 to a 9.5. They do a great job. Where I would be worried about my company getting actively involved is in customer recruitment, having to kind of sell products and service and being marketing savvy. You know, when we deregulated, we created we, we left public service electric and gas alone, PSE and G, and we said, well, what do we call our new power company? So we, you know, in our brilliance of marketing, we said, well, why don't we call it PSEG Power? So that's, that's our definition of creativity and marketing savviness. So, so, but, but, if, but if you create beyond the meter services as utility services, then I think you don't have to worry about that marketing and customer acquisition savviness, and we would do a much better job of it. Now, in our energy efficiency programs, there's a lot of stuff we do ourselves, and there's a lot of stuff we contract out, because we don't, uh, we're not as familiar with some of, some of the work that we contract out. So uh, I, I think that at the risk of repeating myself, our biggest weakness would be if you wanted to try and turn us into Nike or somebody that had to really do uh, attractive ads. But that's not my view of 2.0. It's not asking the customer if this is what they want. It's kind of telling the customer, uh, you know, we, we, we just replaced your meter and we noticed that your heating system is 30 years old and uh, you'll be a lot better off in New Jersey. You'll be a lot better off if we change this for you now. And, um, and, and, and that becomes part of the asset base. Uh, we have one here, and then here. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm at the Office of Science and Technology at the Embassy of France in the US. And I had a quick question about um, carbon efficiency and utilities, mm -hmm. and their incentives to be the primary investor on, in the field of carbon efficiency. Um, so you mentioned, of course, our increasing usage of portable electronic devices doesn't offset um, efficiency gains. But those devices often use cloud services, which have massive energy consumption. And Dominion Energy, which powers many of these data centers in Virginia, 
has a very, very low presence of renewables and other clean power sources in their energy portfolio. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the um, utilities increasing the presence of clean power in their energy portfolios? And what do you see the balance in being, whether it be a carbon tax or other policies to encourage those investments and the, the sort of efficiency gains either um, between energy efficiency and carbon efficiency as being a primary mechanism for uh, utilities moving forward? Yeah, Thank so you. Yeah, just to show my continued irrelevance, I was and remain a big believer in cap and trade as the best approach to take. Uh, failing that, which we obviously did several years ago, although hopefully these things can reinvent themselves, I would view a carbon tax as the simpler, m perhaps more widely acceptable solution. Perhaps you can do something with the revenue to make it uh, revenue neutral, lower tax rates, or support some things that maybe aren't getting sufficient support nowadays. And ultimately, that is the foundation upon which you would accomplish all the above, re carbon reductions and energy efficiency. Uh, if, if I were designing a tiered system of, of delivery of energy efficiency solutions as a utility, I probably wouldn't go to the data centers first, not because they aren't capable uh, of yielding some attractive savings, but just from the point of view of I think you want to blend the, the energy savings with uh, the, 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 the social benefits of uh, helping those who can least afford to pay for it themselves. So. Uh, I, I would just count on the fact that as I apply energy savings to customers who cannot afford to pay their bills, that's going to raise the rates of everyone else, right? Because the delivery mechanism, the subsidy, it comes from the rest of the customer population. Uh, now, the, the one that I just put the light bulb, the, the, the multifamily dwelling that I just renovated is going to see their bill go down, even as their rate went up. But everyone else is going to see their rate go up and their bill go up. So you're going to start creating some incentive for other customers to save energy even just, just by virtue of the economics now getting worse. So you'd want to make sure that as you sequence that, the person that you held last uh, was the, the, were those who could most afford to do it. Now, I don't know if that's the data center or, or my home, but uh, you, you put them at the bottom of the list. We have one here. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rick Temchin at Ascent Electric Institute. Um, I think what I heard you say was uh, viewing the utility as the trusted energy advisor. I think that was part of Shelley's question. Um, but also bringing in other um, parts of the market, the HVAC mm -hmm. contractors, the rooftop solar companies, and working with the customer to come up with the best solution. How do these other uh, parts of the marketplace view a uh, utility getting? that much into their business. Yeah, and that, that, that's an interesting question, Rick. And I've seen uh, sort of two perspectives that I understand, but I think are ill-founded. One is, is just keep the utilities away, right? They're going to cross-subsidize. These are not natural monopoly services. They'll mess it up for, for my entrepreneurial startup creative company. I understand that philosophically. I think it's wrong-minded. Uh, slightly better is, okay, no, the utility has to have a role in coordinating the connection of all these things, right? We want our electric vehicle connected to some battery two miles away so the utility can figure out how to deliver the electricity efficiently. And I said, no, 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 I put caulking around the window. Think caulking, think caulking. Uh, but, but the third, and the, air, the one that I am much more of a proponent of is, let me be your sales channel. If you really have a better widget, why do you want to knock on doors and try to convince people to buy it? If you've got a better widget, we'll do two million of them in the span of a couple of years. And, and I tested that with two Fortune 50 CEOs who are in this space, who manufacture product, they shall go nameless. And I asked them, am I thinking of this wrong? Would you not like to have me be your sales channel? And their answer was emphatically yes. People do not like to go into the Home Improvement Center and say, oh, I'll spend 20, 30% more for this device because the salesperson is promising me it will pay itself back. They just flat out don't believe it. And they go for something that's maybe middle range or lower price because they know it's better than what they had. So, uh, so I do think that we can be an enabler of not only the installation and the contractors, but of the manufacturers and the developers of the technology not the developers of the project. They do get cut out. The developer of the project would get cut out because I don't need them to tell me which customer to go to. All right, we got time for one more question for, for uh, Ralph. Uh, well, wait, wait, I'm not going to try to, sorry. <laughs> well, we got one over here. One of these, one of the, you both seem to have raised your hand here. Ralph. 
Choose one. Okay. We have one more. To ask this question. I was a regulator of utilities for the, from the environmental perspective in New England, and I ought to know something about the industry, but when it came to de deregulation, I just kind of checked out. And so I want to ask you a, a pretty basic question because I'm just interested in your re response. How is it the utility, electric utilities, can make more money selling less power? Right. Okay, so. What's the answer to that question? So the answer to that is if I lower my cost, more than I lower my revenue, I make more money. Right? So, but, but, but I don't want to mislead anyone, right? So, so if customer A goes to Home Improvement Center and buys a technology that saves them a kilowatt hour and they paid five cents for that technology, in New Jersey, that customer would put 15 cents in their pocket. I'm using round numbers because they pay 20 cents for a retail kilowatt hour. So if they take the initiative, they buy the energy efficient device, they save 15 cents. If I do it for them, they're gonna save a penny or two because it's gonna cost me 10 cents to finance the wire that's still connected to the house. I don't wanna lose that. It's gonna cost me five cents to go buy that technology for them. They've gotta pay me for that. So that's 15 cents. Then there's five cents of fuel costs that's no longer going to be needed for me, right? I, I, I don't directly buy that fuel, but by buying the kilowatt hour, I pay for that fuel. I'm not going to pay for that five cents anymore. So now the question is, what's the arm wrestling match with the regulator about how much that customer saves? I would argue that if the customer gets three pennies of that, they didn't lift a finger, they're still comfortable in their home, they're not squinting their eyes, they're happy. They've saved three cents without lifting their finger. I'm happy. I got my fixed costs recovered. I made some money on the five cent per kilowatt hour for, for, for energy efficiency. And the only person that's not happy is the variable cost that I've foregone, which is the fuel company. That's the way it works. And, and, if, and if the energy efficiency costs more than five cents, let's say it costs six, six, 11 cents, then you're no longer saving the customer money. Then you have to start asking yourself, okay, what did I just pay to, to reduce carbon by a ton? And you may be willing to do that. I'm not even starting that. I'm saying there's enough low-hanging fruit. There's enough grocery bags in the road. I like that. Left behind. <laughs> Left behind at the, ca at the checkout right. counter. Right. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. But you have no idea what misery you just created for me because my communications people are going to tell me we, pro we told you not to use numbers, Ralph. Do not, do not, do not get into the economics. And people will look at you with glazed eyes. And <laughs> well, we'll, we'll stipulate all those cost pennies per kilowatt hour were, uh, were illustrative. Right, that's right. <laughs> <They're> illustrative. <laughs> right. Well. Not to be attributed to anybody's particular bill. Right, right. Thank oh, you. Well, Ralph, thank you so much. That's and pleasure. I think that was actually one of the, the best simple, simplified explanations of how uh, some of this needs to work thank in you. the financing. And I really appreciate you taking the time that's to pleasure. spend it with us. Thank you thank so you. much.